Today on Listen Up, Beyond the Bucket List, a new hit movie captures top spot at the box office and gets people asking, what do you want to do before you kick the bucket? Welcome to Listen Up, I'm Lorna Duick. The Bucket List, it's a new movie that brings together two Oscar-winning actors and tells a story of grand adventure and dreams fulfilled at the end of life's journey. Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman star in the film about two terminally ill men. They're unlikely friends who decide to make the most of the time they have left by compiling a bucket list. What is this? Give it back. It was on the floor. I didn't know it was a state secret. Well, my freshman philosophy professor signed this exercise. He called it a bucket list. We were supposed to make a list of all the things we wanted to do in our lives before we... Kick the bucket. Yeah. Cutesy. I was gonna redo the list, but then... Help a complete stranger for the good. Laugh until I cry. Not to be judgmental, but this is extremely weak. Today we'll dig into some of the spiritual issues raised by this film. We'll meet a former minister turned leadership consultant who interviewed hundreds of people to explore the most common path to happiness. He'll share lessons he learned while writing his book, The Five Secrets You Must Discover Before You Die. And we'll speak with a Christian educator to ask whether God might have a bucket list for us and what happens when we die. And finally, intimate conversation with a man who really is in the final phase of his life's story. But first, we've all done it, thought about how we're spending our lives and what we should do with the time we have left. And according to movie screenwriter Justin Zackham, that's exactly how this box office hit began. The bucket list came from me just trying to figure out what are the things I want to do with my life before I kick it. Um, and gradually after a little time went by, I couldn't stop thinking about the idea and as writers we tend to do, just scribble notes here and there. Um, I, I, I realized I had to get out of town, so I, I drove up to a cabin up in Idlewild, up in the mountains here in California, and I spent two days and I just wrote out an entire outline. Um, and it was one of those things that just once I figured out who the characters were, once I knew who Edward was and Carter were, it just, it, it wrote itself. To help us understand why this movie, The Bucket List, is creating such a buzz out there, we're joined by psychologist Dr. John Izzo. He's written The Five Secrets You Must Know Before You Die. Uh, Dr. Izzo, The Bucket List is all about what I want to do before I die. How come it's created such a stir? Well, I think there's two reasons. One is what each one of us wants uh, before we die is to know that we lived a full human life. We didn't miss the party. You know, whatever there was to experience as a human being, we had it. And so I think that, you know, there's a real urgency that many people feel, especially in a society where many people now are, are turning 40, 50, 60, getting older, and you begin to realize you're not here forever. What are the things that really matter for me to do? and to become before I die. Tour every country that they tour in the movie and go everywhere that I haven't been in good health. Basically, I would love to travel, spend some time with some friends of mine who I know off the net, but it's pretty much in spend time with my family. I've always wanted to go skydiving. It seems really cool. Well, I want to get married and have kids. And I've always wanted to be a celebrity. Enter a NASCAR race. Maybe some kind of adventure. Well, Dr. John Izzo has his own take on the bucket list. He's written five secrets you must know before you die. Dr. John Izzo, thank you for being with us. Okay, let's get into the five secrets these people told you in these extensive interviews, a team of three of you doing all the interviews, uh, 250 uh, boiled, actually 235, 235 interviews boiled down into five secrets, number one. 
Well, the first thing that I discovered in talking to these people is if you want to be happy, you have to live a life based on your own definition of success. You can't live on the definition of the success from your parents, from the society, from your friends. You have to be true to yourself. You have to know who you are, what brings you happiness, the things that really are important to you. And these people kept saying to me, each one of us has a destiny, a path, something we were born to do, a set of experiences we were supposed to have. And that's what they told us. So when you're making your bucket list, for example, it's not what other people think you should do before you die. It's what are the things that are important to me to do. And it's unique to each person. That's the first thing I learned. You have to spend time thinking, who am I and what is really important to me? Secret number two, before well, I die. Well, the second thing I learned was uh, that uh, we will not regret at the end of our lives the risks we took and failed whether we went for love or wrote a book that didn't work. But at the end of our lives, almost everyone wishes they had risked more. And so what I came to realize is one of the secrets is to leave no regrets. Because what we should fear at the end of our life, I learned in these interviews, is not death or failure. What we should fear is that our last words would be, I wish I had. So if there's something you want to do in your life, get to it. But what if it. you can't do it anymore? Like, I wish I could have had more children. And I can't anymore. So what if, what if, what do you do with those regrets? Well, you know, one of the things I learned in talking to these wise people is if you have regrets in your life, you just have to make peace with them and forgive yourself. In fact, many of them said, don't live in the past. You know, just accept you've lived the life that you've lived, but right now, make changes. In other words, don't get caught in the past because you can't change it, right? Which is why if you're 70, you still can do the things you must do before you die. If you've, th there's time to change our path. Well, exactly. And make peace with what we can't change. Yeah, and, and many of the people that you meet in the book are people who late in life in 60s, 70s, even 80s, had new careers and new lives that they embarked on. Secret number four. The fourth secret uh, I came to call live the moment. And that was people kept saying to me, don't live in the past, don't live in the future be in every moment, never say I'll be happy if or I'll be happy when. Understand that happiness comes from inside of us, not outside of ourselves. It's not out there, it's in here. And what they said to me is be in a place of gratitude. They said each day, focus on the things you're grateful for instead of the things that you don't have and be in the moment, stay in the moment all the time. When Listen Up returns, does God have a bucket list for our lives? That's next. This segment brought to you by Samaritan's Purse. For more information, visit SamaritansPurse.ca. And Listen Up is back examining one of the biggest questions in life. What do I need to do before I die? And we'd like to hear your views on this. Let's talk. What's on your bucket list? Write to us at listenup at listenuptv.com. And here's what some of you thought about a previous show. My wife and I have been touched by your various stories on Africa. In retirement, I've been volunteering regularly with a humanitarian project that helps needy of the world with an emphasis on Africa. Recently, we traveled to South Africa with 12 others and saw how great the need continues to be. It has inspired us to do more going forward. And Listen Up is back looking at a big question in life. What are the things I need to do before I die? Jack Nicholson's new movie, The Bucket List, launched our discussion today. Two men facing death decide to chase after what they want to do before they kick the bucket. Well, does God have a bucket list for my life? Things I need to tackle before I die. We've asked Christian educator and author Joe Boot to help answer that question. His specialty is debate on the subject of God's purposes for the world and for our lives. Joe, why has this movie captured everyone's attention like it has? Well, I think that one of the things we notice about our culture today is we find it easier to deal with some of these big, hot topics, difficult subjects through our encounters with film, TV, soap operas. In fact, people sometimes live their lives through soap opera, sometimes rather than dealing with their own lives. This film takes actually a very difficult subject, the subject of death, the subject of the possibility of what happens after death, life after death, or, or even tackles the question really of meaning in the universe and asks us to um, 
uh, inspires us actually to wrestle with it for ourselves. I went to see so, the movie and I found myself thinking about those critical questions. So it's easier to tackle that through the movies, through a fiction. Does God actually have a bucket list for us? Things I've got to do before I die. Well, he has a purpose for our lives. Whether we could describe it as a bucket list in the, in the way that the, the movie gives That's us a trivial. list, it slightly trivializes it. But uh, he certainly does have a number of things that are important for us. Like uh, what? Well, critically, and I think we're, we're helped actually by some of the wisdom literature uh, in, in the Bible here, uh, one of my favorite passages in all of the Jewish wisdom literature begins, remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, before you say, I find no pleasure in them. Yeah. And then it gives us a list of what it means to go old. You get old. You, you, I, it's, a, it's quite a list. Yeah, you, it, your legs shake, yeah. you, you go start your going blind and death, yeah. your teeth fall out, you've got no uh, sexual desire left. All of those things are a reality of growing old. And then it says, so when all is done, uh, remember God before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is shattered, that description of death, a poetic description of death. Remember God and his commandments because he is going to bring everything into judgment. That is, he's going to hold us accountable for all we've said and done. And there is an instinct. You, you see it in, you know, stories of tragedy. People cry out to God. What is that? That, that oh my God, is there in crisis? Well, in, in, the, uh, in the world view, the Christian world view, uh, we have a God who's created us in his image, in his likeness. The great uh, famous philosopher Augustine said, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. So deep in our consciousness, in, our, in the very makeup of what it means to be a human being, there is this sense of God. God has set eternity in our hearts. Again, we read in the wisdom literature of scripture. And so when we reach those points, I think of silence. There's a brilliant bit in the movie where he's talking about a guy who goes to the top of a mountain and at the top of the mountain, there's no sound. He says he hears the mountain and in the mountain, he hears the voice of God. Those sorts of experiences, you know, uh, in a foxhole, in, a, in wartime, in an accident, on a plane that's about to go down, despite all the noise that's around us, suddenly we're confronted with the silence and it's the voice of God. People say, don't they, that sometimes their whole life flashes before them as they're going into a, uh, a car accident or whatever. It's a, almost a silent moment where it's just you, eternity, and God, and we're confronted with that sense of, I'm a being created by God, and we call out to our maker. Where do I begin that? And that's the challenge. Well, a kingdom, of course, has to do with, how do I enter God's kingdom? It's to do with a, a king, and a king has a reign and a rule. And when Jesus says, seek first God's kingdom, he means God's commandments, God's righteousness, God's life. Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and life in its fullness. So we begin by remembering as the writer of Ecclesiastes, uh, Ecclesiastes says, by thinking about our Creator now, not leaving it till the last yeah. minute, not leaving it till we're dying of cancer, but actually think about it now. What does that mean? Well, I need to think about my relationships for a start. That's a theme the bucket list picks up on. So how do I then get to heaven? Because, because you're, you're, you're saying, you know, there are these issues about living well and making those great choices. But the bottom line, how do I really make sure I'm, if there's a destiny for me mm -hmm. after this, how do I make sure I'm not going to hell, I'm going mm -hmm. to heaven? Jesus speaks about heaven as his kingdom. Now, if you're gonna get into any kingdom, uh, you need, for example, I've been into various kingdoms in different parts of the world and you need a visa. <laughs> uh, you need access from the crown authority. You need okay. the king. To so you've got a visa for me. <laughs> you, need the, you need the access to the kingdom is through the king. Uh, and so, how do, we come to, how do we come to know the king? Well, Christ says that uh, he is the king of his own kingdom. He has the keys to that kingdom. He can give us access. How do we do that? Well, it's by repentance and faith. Repentance is a very old biblical word. It just means to change the mind, to turn around, to remember our creator and the way he's calling us to live, which is very simple. Jesus says, love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Uh, and when we turn towards him in repentance and faith, we can have access to his kingdom. All right, fascinating questions that this uh, bucket list movie is raising. Thank you very much, Joe Boot. My pleasure. Thank you. When we come back, we'll meet a man living with terminal cancer and learn about life's priorities when you're living on borrowed time. That story next. Closed captioning provided by Duca Financial Services Credit Union. Discover more affordable banking at duca.com.
I had no, never really thought about dying. I'm kind of young. <laughs> That's a difficult question. Always thought that there is like a life after death or something. Yeah. Yeah, I always thought you'd go to like, <laughs> get, like uh, brand new Yeah. Lives. Pretty much once you're done, you're done. Yeah. Um, try to experience everything you can beforehand. Well, Listen Up is asking questions that have been raised on the spiritual issues from the box office hit, The Bucket List. Death, it is a fate that awaits us all. And while there is something profoundly intimate about this common human experience, there are lessons to be learned from those in the midst of it. Tony Clark, our next guest, is dying. But he agreed to share with us his most critical priorities as he approaches the end of his life. Melinda Estabrooks has this report. Tony Clark, husband, father, grandfather, friend, mentor, brother, son, vice president, advocate, and owner of a personally signed picture from John, Paul, George, and Ringo. He was living the dream life until three years ago. I was very engaged in my job. I was uh, vice president of sales and marketing for, um, for a frozen food company here in Toronto, uh, enjoying my job immensely. And uh, this was a huge, needless to say, a huge setback. I was diagnosed in June, uh, June 29th of, uh, two, of 2004, and I had a radical nef uh, nephrectomy in July, July 26, 2004, which means my right kidney was removed. Doctors gave him only a short time to live. I had my kidney out, as I said, in July of 2004, and um, nine months later, the disease metastasized into my lungs. And at that point in time, they told me I, pr I could expect to live 10 to 12 months. And that was, gosh, almost three years ago. Yeah, we've had many friends from church and uh, our community surround us, pray for us, a lot of healing prayers. It's been really amazing. We really do think that all the glory does go to God. Uh, we also believe that God uses doctors. And so in that regard, we've been extremely fortunate because we've had some amazing doctors in this. Now, obviously, it sounds like you are people of faith mm -hmm. and, and a Christian faith. Do you think that has helped you through these past three years? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think when you're, when you're, when they tell you you have a terminal illness, it, you, you know, it, it, everything that you do takes on a different perspective. I've always said to, uh, to other patients that I've talked to, and I've, I get phone calls every week from across Canada with uh, Kidney Cancer Canada, and, and they're just at, uh, at, at, they're just in total despair as to what to do. And I said, there's always hope. There's always, always hope. And for me, the hope comes in my relationship with Jesus Christ, but it also comes in, in, in the understanding of how to manage this disease and, and, and knowing that you can, be, uh, you, you can get ahead of the curve and become an advocate or have somebody else, else become an advocate for you. I mean, it, it, uh, you have to become a student of the disease. You really do. And I also think too, Mel, when, when you have a terminal illness, you spend more time wondering what your future is going to be. And, you know, I mean, we don't know what heaven's going to be like, but we, we expect and, and, and hold true to, to uh, what Christ tells us and, uh, you know, that it's going to be better than what we have right here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the closer you get to it, and when you, you know, when you have an illness like mine, you, you know it's, uh, it's around the corner eventually. So um, you, you become much more aware of, uh, of your surroundings, of the, of the, you know, the, the time that you spend with your family and just the time that you spend in relationship with your God. Says Tony says to his relationship with God has motivated him to create population. Kidney Cancer Canada. You know, as I said, I believe God's in control, and out of that has come a huge opportunity to help others. Um, another patient and a friend of mine and myself co-founded Kidney Cancer Canada, which is really, which really started out as a patient-led support group, the first one in Canada ever for renal cell carcinoma or kidney cancer, and it's it's been very rewarding. Um, we not only have uh, have a patient-led support group, we've done advocacy work uh, to help uh, make drugs available for patients who don't have private health insurance across Canada. And we're continuing to expand that initiative into other provinces. We've been successful in Quebec and Ontario and BC, and we're now, we're now targeting some of the other provinces. So look out, here we come. <laughs> Tony, what would you say is on your bucket list today? Honestly, Mel, I, <clears throat> I don't really have a bucket list that says I need to go someplace or I need to do something. To me, it's really about relationships. First of all, my relationship with God. I mean, that has become so much more 
important to me and so much more profound in things that I do every day um, that, uh, as I said, it's, it's, just, it's just become just a, a complete part of my life. And, you know, as, as, as I've said to Sharon, if somebody, if, one, if the doctor said, and it, and it will happen sooner or later, if the doctor said to me I had three months to live, it's not about where I want to go or things I want to do. It's really the people I want to spend time with. And um, God willing, you know, those, uh, if those three months ever come, that I will be able to surround myself with family and friends and, and uh, the people that are really, really close to me and just uh, end my life that way. Mm -hmm. Before leaving this remarkable couple, I had to ask Tony and Sharon the question that was nagging at me the entire interview. Are you afraid? Afraid of death? It's interesting. I haven't been afraid and I haven't been angry since I got the disease. And um, that may be a bit of an anomaly, but I'm not afraid of dying. Um, I think we all are concerned about the process of dying. What's it going to be like? Will it be painful? How long will it last? And so on. But uh, there are six billion of us on the planet and every one of them is going to die. So we're all going to go through it and uh, you know, some of us sooner than later, and I'm, I'm not worried about it at all. I truly believe that I'm going to heaven, I'm going to a better place than we have here. Uh, the sadness is that you know, uh, I'd like to live as long as I possibly can to spend time with my beautiful wife and family. We feel that we have to move ahead. Our daughter also has cancer, and she has the same attitude as Tony. It's like, seize life every day, and I think life is a roller coaster ride, but certainly when someone you love has a terminal illness, it's a roller coaster ride. And the dips are not fun. Well, some days are better than others, for sure. And so some days are better than others, but you know, you can always, that roller coaster is going to come back up again. And that's what we have to do. And for me, I really, really hold to Psalm 23 is, um, you know, God walks with us through the valley, and we, we're not camped out. We've got to walk through it. And that's what we try and do every day, I think. For Listen Up TV, I'm Melinda Estabrooks. When we come back, I'll share my thoughts on dying well in The Wrap. As a broadcaster, I always admired how Billy Graham did his microphone checks. Each time he would read the same verse from the Bible, John 316 for air check. I'm told he wanted to make sure even technicians who would be too busy to listen to a sermon could hear that most important scripture, John 316, the focus of God's bucket list for us. We've posted that on today's website. John 316 was a reminder from Jesus that we weren't meant for this world alone, that death is a transition and the doorway to heaven is opened through belief in Jesus Christ. It would be a tragedy to go through this life choosing all we want to accomplish, but doing nothing to get ready for the next spiritual life. Knowing with confidence you've discovered spiritual truth and have a relationship with God will take some time. And why not get started today? Our suggestions on how to do that are at listenuptv.com. You can read more about it there. So what does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And we'd like to hear your thoughts. Let's talk. What's on your bucket list? Write to us at listenup at listenuptv.com. From all of us at Listen Up TV, I'm Lorna Duick. Thanks for watching.